All right, so again, the three points to the lock. Heel in the crotch. Lock behind the bend of the knee. That's going to get the turn later on. And kickstand out. Go on the other side. And this is just a standard lock. Here it is. The kickstand's out. My hips are in. All right, here's my position. Now, if we're going to master the inside-out lock, then rather than just take the lock with the standard side, I'm going to have the lock, my heel, um, from my inside leg. So I'm going to elevate this leg just for now because I'm not worried about setups. And the technique, the crafty technique here for getting a perfect inside out lock is letting my inside knee rotate and point towards this far armpit. It's going to rotate, point towards the far armpit. And what you notice over here, guys, is that that allows my heel to come in the crotch. All right, that's what a lot of guys miss. So we're coming from this angle, and you guys will see it here. The knee rotates over towards the far armpit, and now as this hip opens, my heel's in his crotch here. You see that? Take the lock, same principles. Lock behind the bend of my knee. Kickstand out. It's pretty easy. Heel with the kickstand on this one. Hip down. Hip down here. There's my kickstand. Okay. Using that knee sliding up to the armpit, I'm going to rewind a little bit here. If I've got the regular lock, okay, and it's not, it's not strong. What I mean when it's not strong here is it's down here by the knee, okay, so it's not going to be effective to create torque on his low back, even if I engage my hips. I'm going to release my lock. I'm going to release my lock and climb my knee up towards the armpit. That's what hides the heel in his crotch. Now I take the lock, and if the lock's not uncomfortable and hard to get, it's probably not good enough. In order to make it comfortable, kickstand comes out, hips come in. Now he starts elevating off of that. Anybody have any questions with the points of the lock before I move on? Um, three points of the lock, heel on the crotch, lock behind the bend of the knee, kickstand out. And that's got, you've got for a standard side lock on the right, a standard side lock on the left. And then you've got an inside out lock on the right and an inside out lock on the left, right here. The good news is when I teach this and when I do this, I don't find that people have a tendency to be more coordinated on one side or the other. It's not like being right handed or left handed. We all tend to be <coughs> fairly uncoordinated with our legs in wrestling. And so learning any of these skills is only going to help whatever your other series is. And that's, that's, I want to make that point as we go here. Is, is learning to activate your feet from the top position and use your feet as threats is only going to help whatever series you run, whether it's an inside bar, um, cross wrist, you know, whatever you run uh, from the top position. Does that all make sense? All right. All right, we'll go over the turn. I'll tell a quick story of how I learned a lesson on this turn. Once I get it going. So regardless of your lock, one of those four locks, if you have those three principles intact, then there, this really becomes an unfair position. All right? So I'm going to do what I call engaging my hips. Engaging my hips, which is difficult to teach. Um, I'll do one time, and then I'll kind of talk you through it for ways that you can help teach your high school guys. All right? Engage my hips. That helps get his hip off the mat. And now the key where I have the lock behind the bend of my knee because I have this lever here. The lever in the leg curl. And the leg curl is what's going to score this for me. So my heel comes to my butt with the leg curl and I stay tall, moving at a gut wrench angle. Forward. Here he comes. I stay tall. I bring his head or my face or his face with me. Alright, you can hunker down here and drop your bicep in his throat and things like that. But you really want to stay tall again, staying dominant over the man. You don't want to go down to his position. If he's to try to explode and roll through, I'm dominant, I cover. Go back. So I learned this lesson really hard my sophomore year. Um, I was getting to the floor of the five seed at nationals in the quarterfinals, uh, wrestling a guy named Gregor Gillespie. And the match went exactly how I wanted it to go. Got a, got a, a, a takedown in the first 30 seconds, got my boot, boots in, got my safe leg, got a five count. And um, after I got my five count and everything solid, one, 
two, three, four, five, I start to feel and hear a little squirming, right? And any, any competitor, he hears or feels that, you know, he, he tastes the blood of the water and he goes for the kill. And so the way that I went for the kill is really, um, uh, what's the word? Ironic? Very ironic. So the way I went for the kill is rather than keeping my hips facing the mat and staying dominant, I began to ease my way down, just seeing his shoulder, just seeing his shoulder, until right at the time when my hip sat down and I was basically spooning him, is when he exploded off his back. I'm on my back, 5'5". Five, 5'5", five. Five, five, I go underneath, don't get out. He chooses top, rights me out, went 6'5". On to win the NCAAs that year, I was on the bottom of the podium. I tell that story as you know, for, for kids um, called the little redheaded boy who lost it all. Um, <laughs> I, I tell it like a short story, and I never cough up the words that it was me. I tell it as a, like a coming of age story that we all read in middle school to have like a lesson at the end, you know. And I'm like, all right, so what's the lesson, guys? <laughs> Especially in, you know, right? With, with 17,000 people watching. That's, that's not where you want to get caught. <laughs> so, again, with this law, in order to keep yourself from spooning, you really need to draw from this leg curl. Engage your hips, that gets his hips off the mat, and you got to earn this hard with the leg curl. That is your heel coming to your butt, and you crawling forward using that leg curl to crawl forward. Because it's going to be tempting. It's tempting. It was tempting for me at the NCAA tournament. Okay, it's definitely going to be tempting for the guys that you wrestle to get an easy exposure by turning their hips here. We, we see that a lot, right? And you know, anytime you're on the same level as that guy, or you're resting anything on your hip, he can pop up and it's a scramble. I can kind of suggest as well, but the best way I know to explain how to engage your hips on top, if you have any sort of a figure four, is when I was in eighth grade um, and I was going into the, the high school football practice, uh, just the, in the weight room, I, I worked really hard, but I was super scrawny. I only weighed like 90 pounds, but I basically like worked so hard that the, high, the football coaches thought it was kind of funny to have me around because I was working real hard. And so I, I go in there. And they had this leg curl machine, you know, the hamstring curl machine. You hook your ankles in there, and you, and you do this, you know. And uh, the honest amount that I could leg curl then, you know, was probably like two plates, like 20, you know, like the pin down on the second one. But the honest, what I could leg curl now is like 70. I think those things are so freaking hard. <laughs> Um, I got really weak hamstrings, I guess, but so so I, I had too much pride to get in there and actually leg curl when I was, should have been leg curling. So I get in there and I just start pumping the machine, you know, just start going to town on it, you know, like, oh, you know, <laughs> just, I just cheat so bad, just hump it and then like the last like two inches was an actual hamstring curl, you know, where I, I humped it and then I was like, you know, getting a little <laughs> at the very end. <laughs> You're in over your head. You know you're not. You're not strong enough to. It's it's embarrassing to do two plates. So so just see how you would get seven plates. You know instead of just going there and hump that machine <laughs> and then leg curl at the very end. So that's basically what I'm doing here. <laughs> Sorry, Josh. <laughs> All right. Once my lock's engaged here, I'm gonna hump that leg curl machine. Boom get it off the ground, 
and now I'm going to get that last two last two inches are going to be that leg curl. There it is. You see that? Again, staying dominant. The uh, the terminology I like to use for this bringing the head is, is like a soup ladle. I'm going to hook my thumb up under, kind of like the ladle of you know a, a, a soup ladle. And now you can use this thumb to manipulate his face. All right, try to get the fall right there. It's, it's a hard pin position. All right, if he tries to belly down, I can catch elbow to elbow here, or better yet, kind of like up in his armpit, and I can try to put my elbow to the mat and get a fall here. All right, but whatever I do, I don't want to ever go down to his level. As I mentioned before, I believe the Safe Leg Series can really complement whatever ride you already do on top and vice versa. If you have a good ride on top that's not a safe leg, it's going to be easier to get a safe leg in. I'm going to demonstrate those, those, some of those techniques. Um, it makes sense to me like this. Very few wrestlers, at least at the collegiate level and below, very few wrestlers have the ability to use their hands and their feet as weapons at the same time. Um, I never rounded the corner on that. Um, if I was hand fighting, I was swinging, and my feet were sort of like stuck in the mat. But if I were moving around, like, like a California kid or something, my feet were so fast my hands weren't even touching the ground. You know what I'm talking about? It seems like it seems like it's fairly easy to master one or the other, but not to be able. It's very very difficult. into those ends and you work towards that, okay, then you're going to see improvement and you're going to be a bigger threat in the top position. Um, so first I'll show setups to the safe leg and I'll piggyback that with how the safe leg can lead to, to other stuff in the top position. Obviously, we, we, we want to be able uh, to get our heel in the crotch. That's the most important piece of those three steps. It's the most difficult. Once you get once you get that, like the guy who taught me, Mitch Clark, uh, if you actually get the perfect lock, you have the ability to tech ball a guy in the first period. That's what Mitch Clark did to British Young in 1999, I think. Was it the year he did? In 1998, that's what Mitch Clark did in the national finals. Is he got the perfect lock, and he got to just run it. So it's really unfair, in my opinion. I mean, it's, I'm going off on a tangent, but think about if you could do this with the cross wrist tilt, if you could just do a cross wrist tilt, get your count, and like I'm holding here, and then somehow just wiggle your leg and act like your leg had something to do with this. <laughs> and then when you wiggle your leg and show that you're not using it anymore, they just start counting for you again. <laughs> you know, that's obviously really unfair. But it was the same for Mitch Clark when he got the perfect block. It was the same for Mitch Clark in 1998, the national finals, when he got his perfect block. It's all about what he got down here. He gets a count. They give him a five count. Virtus bellies out, and Mitch does this and just waves his hand up like that has something to do with it. <laughs> and then he got another count, and then they went, and he looked up at the ref and did that. All right, and the rules are still that way. The rules are still that way. I think it's unfair and it's a huge competitive advantage for anybody who can get a good lock, but obviously if it was really easy to get a good lock, everybody would be doing that. 
right? So the focus in your teaching is always going to be that. It's going to be get a good lock. And what's a good lock look like? Those three points to a lock. That's what your focus always is. It's not the setups. It's not the any of that. It's if you want to be good at this series, it's about the lock. Can you get it? If you can get a good lock, you can hit it quick. All right, some setups. The chop is a very common breakdown. Well, before I get to that, I'm going to go over one right principle that I actually learned after college, and it's been huge for me in the room as I get older and slower. Um, put down my spell here. Typically, most rides, once you're able to break them down, you've got a deep waist somewhere in there. All right? So this is what we call a grind ride or a four-post ride. And I'm going to be taking inventory of this four posts and making sure I understand where they are. And my goal is to obviously break out all of those posts just like you knock out the legs of the table and the guys land flat. So if I have a count of <coughs> shoulder and his elbow, closer to his elbow, and just try to pump that out. Now, with my head, I'm going to drop on the same side as the deep waist, and I'm going to drop into this armpit right here, and I'm going to bump it out. You see that right there? Now, with my legs, I've got one knee in my a tilt on the opposite side of my deep waist, and my heel is going to be doing what I call an H check. My heel, my heel is going to be peeling this ankle out against his body and checking it. Weight elbow, he's gonna feel his knee. Feel that knee right there. This is where the only post we would be able to bring up to build his base. If my four post ride is perfect, the only post is gonna be this knee. I feel that, and I'm obviously in a tilt position right there to drive him. So I run my four post ride right here. His knee starts to come up, I feel it with my elbow. He just sit and he's threatening to tilt here. Back to his base, I drop my head and run flat. Now, this right here, I believe, is the greatest setup from the top position to whatever series you want. <coughs> you break a guy flat and you're able to control him and keep him flat for some amount of time. All right. What we teach here with the state leg is we teach ankle check. Anytime I get a guy in his belly, I ankle check. Anytime I can get the ankle, I obviously take the ankle. Penn State does an amazing job of this. Upper weights all tend to do a good job of this, um, who are good at this series as well. I ankle check, and now from here, I'm just going to work a bow. Ideally, I want to keep pressure occupying him, him up top while I adjust to get elbow deep. So he's elbowing my elbow crease, racking his heel. Ideally, I want to keep pressure up, and if I come back from here, step. Now, taking the big step here, all right, there's one technique that I remember I learned in college and it helped me out a lot. It was weird. Um, but wrestling puts you saying weird stuff. I'm going to let his, his leg come like right up my butt crack. You see that? <laughs> so right here, it was kind of off. I let it slip right up my butt crack. And when I let it slip right up my butt crack, <coughs> I take my big step. And now this is the only time in a safe leg series that why do you think I can spoon here and it not be a threat? Because I got exposed, right? He's not going to be able to drive off anything because I have exposed. So if you have exposed, you can sacrifice your moral rule well. If you don't, all right? If you don't, you need to keep your hips facing the back. So I check. Free 
Danny said, you can get your heel on the crotch wherever you want it. So whether I want standard side heel or inside out heel, I take the heel and the crotch, I take my lock, and now this lock should be good enough to tech a guy out with because I got <coughs> exact placement of where I wanted to put my heel, which is the most difficult part of the technique. Everybody follow that? Okay, cool. Now here is, I think, the most crafty technique I know from the top position. Grind, ride, four post ride, grind, and ankle check. Tough guys are gonna throw that ankle down and defend, right? They're not gonna give that to you. Now when I pull on his ankle for the ankle check and he defends, watch what his leg does. Go ahead. See how his leg comes up in the air. Okay, so he drives his leg up in the air for me to slip my heel right in his crotch and take my lock and go. All right, that's the craftiest technique I think in wrestling that I know. Turn. Imagine, again, four post ride going on up here. All right, me occupying him up here. I'm teaching down here right now. I ankle check, he just he puts his ankle down. Up in the crotch and go. Four post riding, I'm ankle checking to keep him down on his base, but I'm also ankle checking him because he's going to make his bet one way or the other. I'm ankle checking because if he gives it to me, I've got easy access and nice little perfect access to get my heel exactly where I want. Or if he defends down on it, he elevates his leg. That's my favorite setup. Zero risk, hard work. Hard work. Here's some craftier, less hard ways to get your heel in his crotch without going risky leg riding, without throwing my boot, right? This is how I did it. Without just throwing my boot where he can catch it and we should be, we should be going for a ride. We call this chop off to side boot. So I'm gonna chop, and if I've got a good chop, if I've got a good chop, then just for one second off of this, one second, this hip's going to be somewhat open in the ideal world that I have a good chop. I'm going to jump, shift sides with my hips, jump and catch my knee right in that pocket before he starts to belly. And now as he starts to belly and move forward, that's going to be enough space for me to slip that boot in and go. We call this chop opposite side boot, so my hips float mid-chop. Chop, float, here comes my knee right here. He moves forward and I pick whichever one I'm more comfortable with. I like the inside out boot, take it and go. The same principle, it's a little more difficult to come across. You run a spiral, you run your spiral here, you bump him to his hip and before he recovers down his base, you sneak your knee in. We always lead with our knee with the same leg, not with our feet. We lead with our feet, we may end up leg riding where we're rolling around underneath the guy. My knee comes in, he moves forward, I come in with my boot, take it, and go. So we've got chop opposite side boot, we've got spiral opposite side boot. This is one that Corey Cooperman was one of my assistant coaches at Cornell while I was there for a couple of years. He would just kill me with this, so I had to learn it so I could survive. Go claw. With his claw, he would jump over here like he was throwing a leg in. He was a really crafty technician, so he would always bait me with stuff. He would always bait me with this. And the first few times I'd, I'd reach and I'd grab that leg right there. And he would just break down over, catch a couple cheapies, and then as, as I rolled to my belly, he would drive forward, and this was the boot that he was getting in. Did you see that? This was a decoy. The one that I grabbed, the danger came over here after he caught that cheap and go for it. Okay, so he'd readjust, catch that, and now he had a safe leg and he was running. If he grabs your leg, you can catch a, a cheap tilt pretty effectively. Back up. But if he doesn't grab your leg, and you jump here, he doesn't fall for it, you still rip him back, try to get a cheap two, and look right here, pause. I've got access with my heel. 
right where I want it, the most difficult part of getting a safe leg in. My heel comes right to the sweet spot, right to the crotch, he bellies, and now I work on securing that walk to stand out in front. No central pencil, all, all Pennsylvania. <coughs> by that is I'm going to get one of my heels in his crotch. I've got my count, and now I'm going to put a heel in his crotch, and as he rolls to his belly, I transition to my next turn. All right, any tilt, any tilt, state of Pennsylvania, you guys know how to tilt better than single shade I've ever seen. Any tilt. Side out boot, that's the one I tend to favor right here. All right, I went here before the belly, or right as he bellies, standard side. Side then. So you got to get that thing in. 
If everybody reps on you, he's going to know. I'm not letting my left arm get cross wristed. So you break him down, you get a safe leg in, even if it's not worth a darn. You hop over there, he's going to defend with that arm, and now all of a sudden, you've got your cross wrist. And here you go. Might be your serious. Yeah, but you have uh, about 15 minutes, a little more than that. In order to get his hips off the mat, I try to encourage our guys with their inside knee to corkscrew it out. And when my inside knee corkscrews out, you can see that opens his hip up. Now, what do I have to make sure that they know if they start by corkscrewing in order to get the guy's hip up, you know, what are they apt to do here? Spoon, right? They're apt to do this right here. So after you use that corkscrew to get his hip up in the air, you've got to readjust and really lean on your leg curl again. Lean on that leg curl and crawl forward that gut wrench angle. Um, but using that corkscrew imagery has helped some of our guys. Um, my knees pinch. I also try to, and this is like, looks just like sexual harassment. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I'll put my hand in there. <coughs> Like make sure you know that like there's no space. So there's something about there being no space. Obviously, like the whole all these points of the lock, they're about getting the lock tight to where there's no space. And where there's no space, there's all pressure. And when there's all pressure, you're gonna get a turn. So if this is loose down here at the knee, you know there's all sorts of space in my lock. And anytime there's space, he's going to be sparring and wrestling and wiggling and moving forward, and I'm going to lose the position. So, them just knowing that, knowing that I don't want there to be <coughs> any space, will cause them to flex and squeeze different parts of their legs and their hamstrings and their groin, just to close it off, just to cinch it, just to cinch it tight. And just knowing I don't want any space in there, I don't want there to be enough space for Coach Lean to slip a pencil in there. They'll do things sometimes that they don't necessarily know that they're doing just to squeeze it. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, had a little bit of mileage with that. And then on the head part, are you, you don't seem to pull the jumps to how you attack the neck. You, you just hit the plate. You just hit over, hit over, hit over. I think there are good techniques up there. The reason I don't teach with the emphasis there is because typically if you're having a hard time with that, 
it's, it's indicating that you're having a hard time down here. And so um, I don't teach to it very often because I don't want people to think this is where I'm going to get my turn up here. Does that make sense? Sure. That being said, how do you like which way do you yeah. like There's this, I, I have to tell you, I don't know how to teach this. Quint Wattenberg taught me this. Is he would sneak his thumb up under the guy's chin right here. And he would pull this chin back against the position right there. And then, once he got exposure, then, for comfort, he would let me drop my bicep into the floor. All right? But it was slowly flat. Right here. There's this little hook. You certainly don't want to do this. Tons of high school kids want to do this. They want to go underneath the arm and pull it with you. And get more muscles. You got to blow up again. Take space. It's easier to take the face, too. I'd say, you know, a, a, a B plus would be just like the soup ladle moving it. An A plus would be using that thumb to manipulate that face right there. Okay. Does that help, Ted? Absolutely. Anybody else have? 